everyone. Tonight we're going to do an intro video to my Bible versions video. Um, I was going to post that, but I was just doing research and I was led to, to bring this information to y'all because it's very important when it comes to choosing your Bibles and the versions you have. Now, all new Bible versions, such as the NIV and the, the NASB, ESB, they all use the minority text. They are centered around probably 40 to 50 manuscripts found in Alexandria, Egypt. They are, but there's really only two that they use, Sydney, Sydney Atticus and Vanicanus. Those are two of the oldest codexes that we have, supposedly. And uh, Vaticanus is in Rome. It's been there since probably around the 1500s. And Codex St. Atticus is, was found in Alexandria, Egypt. Now, they, let's start off right at the beginning. It was found by a man named Constantine von Tischendorf in about the 1840s. Tischendorf found it at St. Catherine's Monastery in a, in a wastebasket supposedly being prepared to be burned. Now whether that is true or not, the burning part, we're not sure. But most scholars seem to think that that was a lie that Tischendorf said to spoof up his story and to make it more interesting. But generally, it is believed that this codex was found in a trash bin, a waste basket. Uh, Tischendorf stole 40 pages out of this, or around 40 pages out of this codex on his first visit and brought them to Russia where they remain today. All the pages he brought were white and it looked very much like the white you see on this board here. Very white colored. Now, Tischendorf returned a couple of years later because the monks would not allow him to take the whole manuscript, or really any of it. He, he took it without permission, for what we can understand. And a couple of years later, he returned for the remainder of the codex. And the rest of the codex was not white, but was more of a yellowish color. Now, whether he just grabbed the 40 whiter, more white colored pages in it, or something else made those pages yellow, we don't know. And I'm not trying to give you a conspiracy theory, I'm just telling you what, what it is. The pages he turned in, and that you can see on the website, were white. The ones that you see now, most of the manuscript, is a yellowish, older looking color. Uh, the Codex is a complete Bible, I put that in parentheses, because it is not a fully complete Codex or a fully complete Bible, uh, probably about 40 to 50 percent of it is missing out of the Old Testament. Um, and it has extra books in it, such as 1st and 2nd Maccabees and Tobit in the Old Testament, and books are either incomplete or missing. Most of the, the, uh, the manuscripts from the beginning of the Old Testament are very incomplete or missing. The New Testament has all the books that we have in our Bible, and two non-canonical books, the Epistle of Barnabas and the Shepherd of Hermas. These are two Gnostic-style books written in at least the second century and were not written by eyewitnesses. They were written by later Christians or Gnostic writers. They are not inspired text, hence they are, that's the reason they are not in your Bible. Yet, it is in this one. This codex is generally dated to around the 4th century to about 350 to 400 AD. It's the oldest complete codex of the Bible, even though we have manuscripts much earlier. We actually have one manuscript, P52, which is from John, was dated to about 125 AD. Some people even put that date at 100 AD. And it is John 18, 31 to 33, and verses 37 through 38. It's a very tiny tiny piece of manuscript. And it's interesting because scholars always try to put John as the last gospel written, yet that's the earliest manuscript we have is of John. This codex has been corrected or edited by at least three to four scribes throughout the ages. 
i.e. correction citations, read correction citations, you will actually see on the pages of the codex. And I want you all to not take my word for it. I want you to go to the website that I'm going to give you and look at the codex yourself. I want you to investigate this matter. Don't take my word for it and do not take the word of a scholar or the, the subtext of what they put in your Bible when they say the best and oldest manuscript that is subjective. The scholars put that in there to make you think that it's the best and earliest manuscripts have it. This may be one of the earliest codexes we have, but whether it is the best or not, that is subjective. That comes down to opinion of man. And you deserve to see the codex that they are trying to tell you is the best, okay? So you go and look for yourself. You can Google it. Go to Codex Sinaiticus on Google, and you'll see it. It's uh, The actual website is, uh, I think, codexsinaiticus.org. And you can pull it, go to see the manuscript in the right upper corner, and you will be able to pull up every page of it. Now, this codex differs from 95% of all texts we have, sometimes in big ways. 7,578 differences than the majority of manuscripts, and 2,370 are very serious differences. This codex contradicts Vaticanus, this guy in Rome, which is supposed to be the second or you know, one of the top five earliest codexes. When I say codex, these are just the ones that we have that are full Bibles. They're not the oldest manuscript. They're just the ones that have all the books. So it contradicts Codex Vaticanus in over 3,000 places in the Gospels alone. There are over 23,000 alterations and corrections, mostly during the 7 and 8, 6 and 700s AD. And that's still going up. That number is increasing as more people study. Tischendorf admitted that the New Testament in this codex is, quote, extremely unreliable. In many occasions, 10, 20, 30, even 40 words are dropped later, are dropped, and uh, letters, words, even whole sentences are frequently written twice over, or begun and immediately canceled. In other words, starting a verse, stopping a verse, and starting a different verse. This is done over 115 times in the New Testament alone. It has 423 readings in the Gospels that alone that no other manuscript has. Vaticanus has 197 readings that no other manuscript has. None. So 443 readings are in Codex Sinaiticus that are not in a single other scrap of manuscript we have. They're totally unique to that one book. It was written it was written during the heyday of Gnosticism in Egypt. During the from about the 200s to the 500s or even 600s, the Gnostics were a big movement that was going on in Alexandria, Egypt and all throughout the the Christian world, mostly, probably mostly confined to the Egyptian area, but some of it is in the Byzantine. I think even the Shepherd of Hermes might have been uh, written up at either in this area, Rome, or Byzantine area. It has no genealogical record to trace this codex to, i.e. no link to any apostolic churches where the originals were sent to, such as Ephesus. In other words, we don't have a clue what this codex was copied from, where this codex got its information, its verses, nothing. We have no information on the history of it other than it was found in Alexandria, Egypt. The majority of Byzantine texts, which is where we get most of our texts, we get over 90% of our biblical manuscripts from this area, from Antioch, the Greece area, and and Rome, that's the western portion, uh, the Latin area. Um, it was written more looks like a rough draft or a very un untrained scribe. It has some strange anomalies concerning its finding, i.e. it was claimed to be a forgery by, by a fellow named Samadides. He actually came out and said 
that he had written this in the 1800s and left it at that monastery. Whether that's true or not, I have no idea. But it is a, it does have very strange origins, okay? Uh, this is supposed to be called the oldest and best in biblical su uh, in your Bible subtext. When you see on the bottom pages of the last verses of Mark, it's going to say the oldest and best manuscripts don't have this. They're talking about this book in Vaticanus. Those two are the only two manuscripts of Mark other than one written in the Middle Ages that doesn't have the end of Mark. Only two. And so they're trying to tell us that the ending of Mark doesn't belong in the Bible because these two, two manuscripts don't have them. Now you can see this this in the, you can look this up for yourself. Now I printed off some pages, now forgive me because my printer is, it, the, the uh, color was not working correctly, but I'm going to show you some of the pages anyway. But I want you to look at the text yourself. Do it yourself. Don't take anybody else's word for it. Don't go by the words of man. Go by the words of God and the Holy Spirit. Now let me show you some of these pages from the Codex. This is the, the first chapter of Mark. Do you see? Do you see the corrections? Every page has these corrections that I've seen. Every page I've looked at. Here's Matthew. Matthew 5. Correction. Correction. Corrections. I apologize for it being uh, badly printed, but that was just the way our printer was today. Corrections. This is the end of Mark, and look at that. There's where Mark ends, and look at that big old space there where the text is missing. I wonder what could have went there. Now, maybe it really didn't, maybe the scribe really didn't have the end of Mark, but that right there is very suspicious of an ending that was just left out. Whether it was or not, I don't know. I cannot tell you because I wasn't there. Here's the first chapter of John. Let's look at it. Look at those. There's errors. Errors. Adding. Errors. Everywhere you look on this codex is filled. Here's Revelation. You know the book that says if you add or subtract from this book, you would be you could have your uh, name blotted out of the the book of life or the tree of, took from the tree of life. Well, look at this. This is in Revelation. If I was going to copy a book correctly, I would make sure I would copy Revelation correctly. So. All of those marks, to me, look like something you would see out of a, a uh, badly written paper you have to grade in school. And that was done in a hurry that you, and you knew they didn't try their best to do it. If you were really trying to do this, I want you to ask yourself this. Let's say that tomorrow everything, the internet, the, the printing press, everything vanished. And the only way to preserve God's Word for your children and the next generation is for you to copy it. Would you copy it in such a, in such a sloppy format as this scribes or these scribes apparently did? Uh, uh, some, uh, some scholars actually say they've never seen a manuscript this sloppily copied. Or would you take it as God's Word and make sure you did everything in your power? to make sure you didn't make mistakes. Yet this guy, who they tell us is the most reliable manuscript, has corrections and uh, additions, subtractions, and started sentences and, and uh, edited sentences in per every page. Go to Isaiah. Go to the first chapter of Isaiah. When you go to that website, it is full of corrections. Now this is the main guy that all your new Bibles are based on. And all the new Bibles, when they go with the earliest, they, the, the reason they love it is only because of the date. They only love this manuscript because supposedly its date is early. And it is. It is early. If it is 
a true true document and not a forgery as has been claimed. I'm not saying that it is, but if it is true, then it is the earliest codex we have at the moment. But just because something is early does not mean something is more reliable. It may it does have a hint of logic to that, but think of it like this. Let's say you wrote a book, or you did, let's say you took uh, you wanted to copy uh, a few pages out of the book The Hobbit. Let's say you copied that pages and did it terribly right after the book was written. But then let's say your child or something copies it 40 years later, and guess what? It does it right. Does that mean that your adult, your child's copy, just because it's a little bit later, should be thrown out because yours is earlier, and they should go with yours as the more proper reading? Well, that's what the scholars are saying. They're saying it doesn't matter anything about which one is uh, more reliable, which one has a, a link to the apostolic churches, which one has been accepted by the church for generations. The majority of manuscripts that agree, it doesn't matter. It's all based upon the age. And what they mean by that is they call it the quality, but that all comes down to the age. Psalms 12, 6 through 7. The words of the Lord are pure, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. It's the King James Bible. Now, I have very big problems at believing that God's word was left in a, in a uh, closet in Alexandria, Egypt, and only to be found by a thief that would steal pages from it, lie about it, and save it from the garbage can. That that would be the only way we could get God's Word. And that every Christian throughout the 2000, nearly 2,000 years, well, 1,700 years since this was written, had it wrong. I do not believe that. I believe God preserves His Word, and we have His Word. God, He... <laughs> If he can inspire the text, he can preserve the text. The, new, the scholars that give you the new Bibles, they will all say that they believe in the inspiration of the text, of the autographs, but they do not say that God preserves the, his word through the copies. That's not what Scripture says. Scripture says God will preserve his word from this generation forever. So, this is just uh, the first part. Now, guys, I am not trying to tell you that you can't read the New Bibles and get saved, or read the New Bibles and have spiritual, you know, links to, or, you know, feel the Spirit within you or anything like that. I'm not saying that. I want you to read your Bible. I don't care which one it is. I want you to read your Bible. Please. That's that's the main thing. You don't. I don't... Even in this extremely corrupt text here, you can read that Bible and still get the gospel, okay? But I do believe that you should see the truth. What, the new, what these new Bibles and the, new, and the best and oldest, what they're telling you, you should see the truth and not just have to take their word for it because they're scholars or they're, you know, higher and more powerful than we are. It comes down to the Holy Spirit. If you come to a text that's in the New Bibles versus the Old Bibles, you pray to God and let Him reveal it to you. If you come across a verse that these guys say shouldn't be in there, you ask God Himself whether that verse is genuine or not, whether He inspired that verse. Because I believe that the verses we have, God preserved. I do not see the church getting verses wrong throughout generations with the Holy Spirit guiding them. They're supposed to be self-authenticating scriptures. In fact, I'm going to tell you, give you an example. Uh, St. Augustine was living about the same time this, this codex was written, or maybe the 5th century, just a little bit later maybe. He had a copy of, uh, written in Latin by Jerome, who was in Rome. He copied it from Greek manuscripts. 
in uh, where he was in Rome, and he sent it to North Africa, where where uh, Augustine was at. Well, Augustine said that pretty much everything that he did, he copied, would work with the Greek text that Augustine had. But they were reading in the Book of Jonah, and one word in the Book of Jonah was changed from God to ivory, to ivy. One word. And the entire town that St. Augustine was living in rioted over that one word changing. Now these new manuscripts, or these new Bibles, were going to tell you that huge portions, like the uh, woman caught in adultery story, shouldn't be in there because it's not in the oldest and best. But let me ask you, do you think that the church who literally can remember the book of Jonah down to a single word would not catch an extra t like 10 to 15 verses added to John? I don't believe that. I believe that God preserves his scriptures. I believe he preserves it by his Holy Spirit and in the hearts of all those who read his word. But this is, I just want you to look for yourself. Ask God and pray about it. I believe that you can find the truth. Those that seek the truth will always find it. The door will be open to you. And this is just a, the, a primer for my biblical videos, uh, my big biblical virgin videos. And please don't think that I'm trying to persuade anybody not to read your Bible or anything like that. Breed it. I don't care if it's the NIV. I don't care if it's even the New Living Translation, which I have massive grievances with because they take big liberties. But please, just read your Bible. I, I want you to know what, when you see in the subtext, oldest and best. I have no problem with scholars using this, this codex. No problem at all. But I have problems when they say it's the best. That's subjective. That's an opinion of man. You don't know that. This, this thing probably could have been copied terribly. It could have been copied perfectly. Which, it doesn't seem that way from all the alterations and problems with it. But... You deserve to see the truth. And I pray that each and every one of y'all will find this edifying, that it will lead you to furthering reading the Bible, furthering in the Spirit, and that God will lead you to the truth. Thank you guys so much for listening, and God bless.